became a Christian, have you noticed that you just can't get away with things like you used to? I remember a long time ago when I was starting out in ministry, there was a, this awesome rad girl in the youth group and she was just a servant. She loved Jesus. She had a genuine, authentic walk with God and she was just the type of person, she was there on Sunday, she was there at youth group, she was not just a, you know, a chair a potato, but she served, she was all about it, she was into it and she worshiped God very passionately and you just saw like, wow, you have an amazing life ahead of you. And then a, a string of unfortunate uh, events happened in our life. Um, pain and heartbreak and frustrations and unanswered prayers. And it was one of those things where like when it rains, it pours. And for the first time in her life, she was really, really faced with those questions. Like, God, are you there? Why aren't you hearing me? Why am I going through this? And it got pretty bad for her to the point where, you know, she, she made a really, really bad decision. And, you know, she was the type of person where she, she was just so fun to be around. She had a lot of non-saved friends, a lot of them. And she could balance that line very, very well of being a Christian and not compromising and everything like that. So she had, like, some friends who would go and, and party and, you know, do the whole high school thing. Some of you know what that looks like. And, and um, you know, they, they respected her. They respected she didn't do it and everything like that. But after it all just came down, she just kind of got this sliver in her heart that said, I'm just going to go get wasted. <laughs> and so she never drank a drop of alcohol in her life, and she decides she's just going to do it full force that night. And that night, she gets a DUI. And she's so scared. She's like bawling, like, the one time. It's like, sh this happens to this poor little girl. Meanwhile, her friends, Party Central, never got caught. Never through high school did they get a DUI. So why is it the Christians who are the ones who always get busted? I think we find the answer to that question in our text today. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, it says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons." So the simple answer to the question, why do Christians always get busted is, God loves you too much and he's too involved in your life to let you get away with sin. The apostle Paul is writing to a group of Jews who had gotten saved and life was super tough for them. They had lost a lot, they were being persecuted. Many of them were really, really discouraged and tempted to stop following Christ all together. And so this passage was written from a heart that wanted to encourage believers how to think and how to feel when you're suffering, afflicted, and when life is just not awesome at all. Paul, for his own life, went through a lot of junk, and he always looked at sufferings as a means of spiritual purification and completion that God always uses hardship, whatever you go through, to shape your character to where you're gonna be more like Jesus when the ball game's over. So verse five says, it says when you're rebuked. It doesn't say if, it's a matter of fact. And it says, don't be discouraged. Don't let yourself go down this bad path. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by God. I mean, haven't you ever been rebuked and corrected by God? I'm so messed up, it happens every time I read my Bible. <laughs> I'm serious. God confronts me every time I read the Bible and pokes at me and gets to me because he's, he's like the doctor or the dentist. You know you need him, but you don't want to face him. 
I mean, doctors are so good at what they do, and people get so freaked at seeing them because they know a doctor's not going to be a yes man in my life. A doctor's going to tell me what I need to hear, no matter how painful, no matter what the news is, he's going to shoot straight with me. And so some people, they, they don't go see the doctor. They're so stubborn because they don't want truth. So they'll never be set free because Jesus says truth, when it hits your life, it'll always set you free. Truth will always bring healing. Truth will always lead you to a path of freedom and health uh, in, in who you are in your core. And so I'll read the Bible and I'll just get blasted. and It hurts, but it hurts so good, you know, because it shows me how I'm gross. It shows me how I'm a jerk. It shows me where I missed the mark, and, and it allows me to work on correcting those things to where I can be the person that I really want to be, the person my wife wants to be. So it says, don't be discouraged. Why? Why shouldn't I get discouraged? Why shouldn't I throw a pity party? Well, it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now, pay attention to this very closely, okay? The word chasten does not mean to punish. If you've received Christ and you belong to God, his correction is to never punish you or to make you pay for your sins. The punishment for your sins was taken by Jesus Christ on the cross, amen? Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. You know how you go astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of of us all. God does not punish his kids. He disciplines them. And there is a great difference. The word chasten here means to guide, to educate, and to train. And so th this is really what it looks like. When God rebukes you, when he corrects you, when he disciplines you, when he busts you, he never ever does it in anger. God will never discipline you and freak out. You know, like you've done it as a parent, right? You don't got to raise your hand because just don't. But, you know, you, you're lack of sleep and you're just so fed up with it. And all of a sudden you, you flip out on your kid more than you should. And you feel bad afterwards. And, and you, you have to say to your kid, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. I, you shouldn't parent in anger because God doesn't. He's always cool. He's always calm and collected when he disciplines. It's well thought out. God has never screamed at me. He, he, he's not the type where he's just going to lose it and paddle his kid in anger and leave a mark that doesn't go away for a while. It's, it's not who he is. He doesn't punish. He instructs. He chastens. He trains. But he's on top of it, you know. He, he, he does a good job. He's always at it, always at it always chipping away at us. Look at verses seven and eight again. It says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So the main point, the bottom line is that if you're going through life and you're rebelling from God and you're doing what the Bible says to not do. And if you're not being disciplined, if you're not being trained and rebuked and corrected by God, it means you're not a son or daughter of God. That's what this is saying. That's why your non-saved friends never got busted. But you couldn't get away with nothing. You know, you, you think you can. You know, maybe a couple months go by and you think like, I got this covered, I'm... I'm doing all the things that I need to do while dad knows the whole time. He's just waiting for that moment. I remember one time I thought I was getting away from it. I, I was getting away with it and everything. I'm like, oh, I'm so sneaky. And man, he just waited till the right time where it was going to just make my heart drop the most, you know? And it's like, what? You knew? Oh, this stinks. And so God, if you belong to him, it says he trains and disciplines those who are hid. He deals with you as a son, a daughter. So when, when things don't work out right, when life is really crummy, the chastening should never be taken as a sign of his rejection, but it's a sign that he's treating you as a child. And, and I'm thankful. Guys, there, there are so many things 
I can stand here today and be thankful of that at the time I hated it. I was even getting bitter at God for it, but I'm so thankful for it now through the process of time. I'm so thankful that a couple times in my teenage life, I got arrested. I'm so thankful for that. I hated it at the time, super bummed, wasn't cool at all, took the buzz away immediately. And yet if he wouldn't have done that, I was on a path to self-destruction, guys. The, and it was a sign that I, I belonged to him. It was a sign that he saw my heart and he's like, I know there's true faith in there somewhere. And he busted me because he loved me. Haven't you noticed since you got saved, you just, you can't get away with anything. And so when I see Christians backslide and they start to do dumb things or, you know, there's sometimes there's a parent and their kid has, has gone wayward and, you know, they're embarrassed. They're, they're embarrassed. They don't want it to reflect uh, themselves as a parent. And so they're like, oh, I, I feel so bad. I, I feel so embarrassed that you know. But when I find out, I'm like, yes. This is such a good thing. I'm so glad they got busted. And I'll tell the parent, this is so great. They got arrested or whatever happened because I look at it and it's a sign. Okay, God, they really do belong to you. Thank you for not letting them continue down that path because when one of God's children really gets busted and caught, you will see them repent and they will come to their senses and they'll get right with God again. They can't. They can't take not being right with God for too long. They just can't take it. A true believer can't take it for too long. And so you got to remember, he's not just your God, he's your father. And so you just give it time because he'll, he'll make sure to bring the consequences when one of his kids are really messing up. And if the consequences and the correction never comes, you know, you're being patient, you wait years and it never comes. It says here, it's a sign of illegitimacy. They may not really have a relationship with God at all because his hand of correction means you are his. What does this speak to you? I mean, because this is so multifaceted and we're so different and we have a range of, of things in our life that makes us so unique, but God is able to deal with each one. How does this speak to you? If you find yourself here in this room and you're like, I know I got secret sins. If you don't, if you don't know what your secret sins are, then just give the Holy Spirit like one, two, okay, it's there now, you know what it is. If you got stuff in your life that you, if you're really honest with God, you know it shouldn't be there, but you've been trying to manage it, you've hidden it, you know, you've hid it from him, you've hidden it from them, you've hidden it from her. The worst is when you hide it from yourself and you deceive your own heart to think it's not good. But when God really gets a hold of you and you're able to see it, if you're not getting caught, if those things aren't getting addressed by the people closest to you, be afraid. You should be terrified today that you are in danger of going to hell. Because that's what's at stake here. It really is. And so if that happens to be, you just say, God, come on. <laughs> like, I want to be right with you. I, I want to submit to you. I want, I want you to deal with me. Deal with my life. Let me get it out. Because the hiding and everything, it, it just, it leads your life to ugliness and it'll destroy you. And it'll destroy the people around you that you don't want to hurt, but you'll hurt them the most. So if this speaks to you in some way, listen to this. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. And he will, if you return, if you get your heart right with God and you keep turning to him and seeking him, he will mend you, he will heal you. We, we've lived that. You know, some things are easy to explain away. There's some things in people's lives that happen. You're, you know, any Christian can diagnose and access it. And then there's some things that, that, that they're beyond any explanation. When, when my wife's mom, Dixie, died suddenly, out of nowhere, tragically, from a heart attack when she was 46 years old, no one could explain that away to us. It was just awful. It was a tragedy. And so there's some things you just, you, you can't explain. You don't know why. 
But yet, you turn to the Lord, and he heals, and he mends, and he shows you how good he is, and he meets with you in that place of suffering. He meets your heart in brokenness in a real tangible way. Anyways, in verses 9 through 10, as we move on, it's talking about how how God's chastening is just, he does a lot better job than our human dads did. In verse 9, he says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more be readily in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they, indeed, for a few days chastened us, as it seemed best to them, but he, God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, understand back in that day when this was written, all Jewish dads were invested into their children. It wasn't like a society today where you have a lot of broken homes and dads just not really loving on their kids. The Jewish culture is very family-centered, Judaism. Most dads were really involved in their kids' life. And so Paul is saying, we, we respected our dads. And so why, why, why is it that a dad who disciplines his children ends up earning respect from them? How does that happen? Well, a dad who doesn't discipline is a dad who's not involved and invested. And a dad who's invested will always be respected by their kids because respect is always earned. Salvation might not be earned, but in all facets of life, respect will always be earned. And it's especially true when it comes from a child towards their parent. And so this is how this plays out so often when it's a negative situation, okay? So the kid starts to grow up and he starts disrespecting his parents. And, and he does it because he's convinced his, the parent doesn't love me enough. The parent's not involved enough in my life. And so that's where the disrespect comes from. So the disrespect a parent feels always comes after the lack of love a child feels. It's not natural for a child to disrespect their parent. It's natural for them to disobey their parent. I mean, you, you see two-year-olds and they disobey. They're just cute little sinners, but they're sinners, you know? And they just, they just disobey. But even in that, it's not natural for a kid to disrespect their parent. That comes over time. And so the, he's thinking the whole time, I, I just, I'm not invested in. And that's where it comes from. So if you are fortunate enough to have a great dad who did a really great job and you respect him, that's awesome. It says here, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? So when a child shows disrespect towards their parent, ultimately, this is what it means. That child is putting themselves as their parents equal, okay? Disrespect comes when the, the child has finally said, I'm your equal. Why does that happen? Because they think, the child thinks, I know what's best for my life. Because in their mind, they're saying, my non-invested parent who really has no idea who I am because they haven't been there for me, they don't know what's best for me. Now you're telling me what to do and I got to do this when you don't even know who I am. Why do I got to listen to you? Jeez, come on. And you get this disrespect coming, but it's first because they feel like they're not really loved. Now, on a bigger level, when this happens towards God, there's some serious issues. Because if you resent God for his decisions, what he's allowed and his corrections in your life, you're basically doing the same thing that teenager is doing. Subconsciously, you're making yourself God's equal instead of submitting to him as a child. So this is why... Submission to God is always easier for those people who know God relationally. It's hard to submit if you don't know him because you don't know how good he is. You don't know how loving he is. And so to the person that is taking the time to know him and have a relationship with him, when junk happens in their life, they can take it because they know you're invested. You're involved in my life. In verse 10, we see this contrast even further between a, a human dad and, and the heavenly father. It says, they, the human dad, indeed for a few days chastened us, 
as it seemed best to them. You know, even the best dads can't compare to having God over our lives because all human dads make mistakes no matter how rad they are. God never makes mistakes. So everything he does or allows is always, do you believe this? It's always for your internal and eternal benefit. You gotta know that God knows how to get the best out of you. He sees your untapped potential and, and, and he, he knows how to get the best results from your life. He knows how to get you to outdo yourself in life. And so he's always chipping away to get you to reach your potential. And I can so relate to this because it's like, as a father, my job description is to prepare my kids for life. So as they grow up and as I see what they're into, whatever it may be, if it's music, sports, or academics, if I see them not reaching their potential, I'm, I'm gonna train them. I'm gonna get on them a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna prod them to get going. If they're really good at sports and they wanna do that and they're slacking off, I'm gonna be like, dude, you should be first string. Like, why is this guy playing over you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna help them. I'm gonna encourage them towards it. If it's, if it's academics, well, that requires a lot of reading. So it's like, okay, come on, let's do this. I see your potential. And that's what God's doing. He always has the finish line in mind for us. And so one of the quickest ways for you to get discouraged and so bummed out in life is when you're only able to see what's right in front of you. And you only deal with God based on what's happening today and maybe the last week. That's not where you need to be. Because when you can take a step back from your life and see that your life never ends and that God is, is... wanting to get you to run your race to to reach your finish line, then it's a lot easier to go through the ups and downs of life. It's way easier because you have you have a heavenly perspective. You have a godly perspective on your life. The second half of verse 10, it says God, you know, when he chastens, it's for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. He wants us to partake of his holiness. Now, I I could talk about this for an hour, but really the only way to make this powerful for your heart is if the Holy Spirit shows you what this means. For God to invite you to partake of his own holiness, that you can be a partaker of his own divine nature is super, super cool. Because God's holiness is what separates him from this planet. You know, do you see God walking around on this earth? No. He's separate because he's holy. And holiness is way underrated, y'all. His holiness is the white, bright, hot, intense heat of his purity that just melts away any darkness. If we were here in a dark room and we couldn't see and you turn the lights on, the darkness is powerless. It goes away. That's the holiness of God. God just shows up and his holiness makes everything crappy go away. The darkness vanishes and God says, I want you to partake of that. I want that to be in you. I want it to flow through you. I want it to go through every little chamber and room of your heart. I want it to be in the bedroom. I want it to be in the basement. I want it to be in those little attic spaces where you, you, you try to hide from me. I want to come in there because I'm gonna make you holy and I'm gonna set you apart and your life is gonna be so different than the boring lives that this world lives. Hey, God is not boring, people are boring. God is awesome, amen? I found a verse that just really meant a lot to me uh, when I was trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. (laughs) I'm glad the Lord showed it to me as a teenager. It's Psalm 119, verse 67. It says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You can relate to this, can't you? I mean, if God never corrected you or chastened you, a lot of people that are here in this room would not be here you know you wouldn't be the man or the woman you are today without it. And so for me, when I was going astray from God, doing my own thing, doing whatever my fleshly impulses directed me to do, it, it, the world lied to me and it chewed me up. And because God loved me, he gave me affliction. One particular thing that happened in my life is I, 
I was so full of the world and I had a pretty good thing going because I, I was going to go play college baseball. And that was like a, a dream of mine. And my heart was so black in the meantime and I was addicted to that. I don't even know how I was playing that well. And the second to last tournament, my senior year of high school, I tore my rotator cuff. And that meant I couldn't go play college baseball. And I thought my life was like devastated, you know, like it was, it was over and everything like that. But it was through that, it was through the depression and not going off to college that first semester after I graduated that I remember, I remember distinctly going into my closet in my bedroom and there was this big cardboard box, I got it out, I opened it up and I searched through it and I found the Bible that was given to me a long time ago that I, read in, I hadn't read in years. And God began to speak to me. And that was kind of the beginning of, you know, I have a Bible open before me now. It was just God loving a very broken, lost person. That's all that happened. And so affliction brings holiness into your life. It's amazing that when 9-11, as tragic as it was, how many people came to church that next Sunday? A lot of people got right with God after 9-11. You know what I'm saying? And so when these things happen, it has a, it has a way of purging and cleansing a soul. Verse 11 is the concluding verse to this section. It says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And so Paul, you know, he's saying, do what I did, because he lived this. He's telling us to do what all the great people in Hebrews chapter 11 did that we covered. Have the faith, have the guts to look beyond the process of suffering and look to the results of suffering. You got to do that because when you do that, that's what following Jesus really is. It is. It's so easy to say I follow Jesus, but man, when, when life's hard and the tears are real, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But remember the verses that preceded this text today. Look, look back at verse two. It says, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your own soul. And so when, when you're able to look beyond the present into the future, you're following Jesus. He hated the cross. And yet he stretched out his hands and he was tortured to death because he looked for something joyful that would come afterwards. He had faith for that. And the same is true for you and for me. So my question for you guys very simply today is, are you doing a good job of being trained by God's discipline? Are you rolling with it or are you not doing so great with it? If you ask the question, well, how do I really know that? Well, do you have peace in your life? The reason why some people live this one crisis after another, after another kind of life is because they're either blind to God's chastening or they're resisting it. They haven't been trained by it. And so as verse 11 says, the peaceable fruit of righteousness is not evident. Guys, th there, there comes a point in your Christian life, for some, for some people it happens as a teenager, for some people it doesn't come till later in life, but we all pretty much have to come to this same place where we have to hash out some things in our hearts with God. He has reasons for what he does and for what he allows. And you have to believe that the Bible says his ways are higher, his ways are better, He's never going to solve the situation the way I would or else I would be God. And if I were your God, I would not be a very good God <laughs> to you. I'm not him. And so he does things differently. He's so beyond us. And so I've come to a place that no matter what happens, I know because I know who he is. He's been loving to me. He's restored me. He's redeemed me. He's brought me through some dark times. I don't doubt what happens for the rest of my life. And no matter what happens to me from now on in my life, you're not gonna get me to stop following him. It's just not gonna happen. 
It's too real. It's not because of an upbringing. It's not because of, oh, this is how I feel like I fit in. Or maybe I'm a pastor. I have some sort of influence and I think it's cool, so I'm going to stick with it. It's just because I know who he is. And no matter what happens, I'm just a real dude. And junk's going to happen in my life. You're not going to get me to stop following. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop relying on this Bible because I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And I can stare you in the eye and I can tell you, I will see him. It's going to happen to me. I will see him. I will stand before him. I'll probably drop before him. He's going to pick me up, but that's going to be cool, right? And nothing can take that conviction, the reality of that away from me. If it can't be taken away from you, say amen. Amen. Love the sound of that. His word says all things work out for our good. And sometimes our definition of good is not his. But his good has a way of playing itself out through time. Now, one of the best examples of how I could think of how this all works is by looking at how God calls us his sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, out of all livestock... Sheep need the most attention and care from their owner than any other livestock. So it's no coincidence Jesus chooses to call us sheep because if he likened us to another animal, it would say to us that God doesn't really want to be that involved in our lives. Some animals don't need much attention at all and they can thrive. Glad he did not call me a cat. He calls us sheep. They're needy. They're defenseless. They're quite stupid, actually. But it shows God's willingness to want to care for us. Jesus wants to shepherd you, which means he wants to lead you places. He wants to make you lie down by the streams of water in fields of grass. He wants to provide for you. He wants to lead your life. But sometimes we're naughty, stupid little sheep, and we're rebellious. And we want to go our own way, and we do go our own way, and we're prone to wander. We're prone to stray. We're we're, we're with our shepherd, and we're eating the grass, and we're like, hey, what's going on over there? What are those animals doing? Hey, they look like they're having fun. Maybe maybe this isn't all cracked up to what it needs to be. Maybe I need to test it and see, is there something else better for me? And our flesh is always being pulled on it, a million different directions of temptations of to, to stray from our shepherd. But because he loves you, he's not just going to let you wander that far because he knows there's wolves out there who want to deceive you and tear your life up into little pieces. Your shepherd will always chase after you if you go astray. Luke Chapter 15, verses 4 through 5. Here in, the, here in our passage, it, it says Matthew. It's wrong. So just know it's, it's Luke 15, verses 4 through 5. It says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. This is the heart of God. If every single one of you are right with God and you're doing great in life, God is pleased with that, but he's he's focused on the ones who aren't here who are struggling. If you know a Christian who isn't walking right with God, would you share the heart of Christ to go after them? Would you do your part to reach out to them? Because that's God's heart, to get them back with him. To spare them from trouble, to spare them from unnecessary discouragement. I want you to focus here on the part where it says, he lays it on his shoulders. Now, Shepherds are very involved with their sheep, and so when a sheep strays, it's usually one of the young ones. It's one of the lambs, and he lays it on his shoulders. Now, here's what happens. If you go astray in your life, you know, let's say in a week or in six months from now, you're not here, you're not serving, you're not reading your word, you're not worshiping. If you're in a place where you're just, you're not following, God is going to do what that caring shepherd will do. He's going to break you. That shepherd will go to that little wandering sheep, that little lamb, and he'll get down and he'll say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And he will break its leg. Literally, Middle Eastern shepherd will break that little lamb's leg. And the lamb is in pain. 
And then the shepherd takes that little lamb and he hoists it up over his shoulder. You know, if he doesn't break his legs, it's just going to go wander off again. And the amazing thing that happens through this process is while that little lamb's broken leg is healing, it's laying on the shepherd's shoulders all day long, which means the shepherd's face and his face are right there. They're so close to each other. It gets to sleep right next to him at night. It's closer to the shepherd than all of the other sheep, and it gets special care and attention that none of the other sheep gets. And, and that wounded sheep's character, it begins to change. That sheep begins to transform into something better, and it learns some important lessons along the way. Lessons that can only be learned through experiencing it. It learns, I can depend on this shepherd when I can't take care of myself. It learns that the shepherd is loving and caring. It memorizes the shepherd's voice because he's been so close to him. And so no wonder Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. If you get 10 shepherds with 10 sheep folds and the one shepherd starts to do his unique call, only that man's sheep will come because sheep have this special way of knowing the voice and you can't trick them. You can't deceive them from knowing and following another voice. And so when that little lamb's leg is healed and he's fully restored, the shepherd takes the sheep off of his shoulders. He, he, he gently sets it down next to him and says, okay, go play with your brothers. <laughs> go hang out. But you know what happens? You know what happens? That little rebellious, stupid sheep now sticks closer to the shepherd's side more than all the others. He's not going anywhere. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. Have you ever been broken by God? Maybe not by him, but he allowed something and it broke you only to find out through the process of time he was sparing you of something horrible for your life, something practically, maybe something in your character. Guys, you know, the breaking, the true repentance, because you can fake repent, <laughs> but the true repentance and the godly sorrow, it's all a work of God in your life. And there's some of you, maybe you don't know it yet, but there's some of you, you live long enough, you know you are not the man or woman you are today without that happening, and you're better for it, and you can thank God because of it. Amen? Amen? Verse 11, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. As we move on to this next section of verses, we, we get some application here. In, in verses 12 and 13, he tells us to get strong. He says, Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. He, you know, he's addressing a people who really is struggling and now he, he's correcting their thinking. You know, these things aren't happening because God's angry at you. He's not punishing you. You're his own. You're not illegitimate. And so this is what you need to do now. Stop moping around because you're gonna regret it later if you do. Change your mind about God and change your mind about hardships and sufferings. And when it says strengthen the hands and feet and be healed, it, it speaks of a, a readiness to, to move and serve God. When hard things happen, the last thing to do is to fall away from serving God. That's not the answer. To be about him, to serve him, to be empowered by him. And so he says, get strong. Don't let the enemy defeat you in this. Don't be a victim to this. Rise up through his enablement and let him outdo what you can do on your own. In verses 14 and 15, he talks about getting right. And he says some deep things. He says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, keep in mind, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are super discouraged 
and who are getting bitter towards Christianity, getting bitter towards the gospel because it's cost them stuff in their life, and they're tempted to fall away. And so he's addressing the results of when you get bent out of shape with God. You ever been frustrated with God? You can be frustrated with God in a good way, and you can do it in a bad way. There's two different ways to be frustrated with God. And if you do it in a bad way, it's going to you know, speak to some of these things. He starts off by saying, pursue peace with all people. Because one of the first things that happens in your life when you get all bitter towards God is your life is stripped of peace. You're so full of unrest and your heart gets all tied up like a giant pretzel. It's so, it, it's just not good, you know. And then it comes out of you, you know, how you view God comes out of you and and you start to treat people wrongly. He talks about bitterness. Don't let a root of bitterness spring up. He likens, you know, a a root of bitterness doesn't come uh, slowly. It springs up like a really ugly weed. You know, weeds just spread quickly. So does bitterness. Man, we got to talk about bitterness, don't we? Have you ever been bitter... Before the Lord, raise your hand, be honest if, if you have. Okay, awesome. That's, that's why you guys are so easy to talk to, because you're just so honest, you know? No one's pretending here. Um, I can't think of anything, really, that has robbed more Christians of their joy in the Lord than the cancer of bitterness that rots and eats inside of who they are. Bitterness, it's once been said, is like drinking a bottle of poison, hoping that it affects somebody else. It is like a small wound under your skin that if you just deal with it right away, you, 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 you pop or you get that little thing out and you, it wipes away the surface and it heals quickly. But if it festers, if, if, if you allow it to remain, it grows and the, and the pus saturates your spirit and it just imp- affects your being, and it just changes who you are. You can't escape from it. No one can escape what bitterness can do to you. So how does God want you to deal with anger and bitterness? If you got an anger problem, please listen up, because it, it means a lot for your life. I love this verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So first, we see that there is an anger that's not sinful. Anger is an emotion that God feels and God doesn't sin. And so there is a righteous kind of anger, but he's talking about an anger that you let turn into sin. How do you do that? You let the sun go down on your wrath, which gives the devil a great foothold in your life. Don't let the sun go down, it says. In other words, do not fall asleep that night without dealing with it. Why? Because the devil, when you're sleeping, can use your mind to be his playground. The dream world is trippy, isn't it? It's like, wow, we've all had weird dreams. I was about to say one, but I'm just not going to. (laughs) Weird. It's weird. And God can use it. We know biblically. And here it says Satan can use it. This is what happens. If you go to bed with an angry thought, you know, you, you've, been, you've been there. You're on your pillow and you're tossing. There's turmoil. It's like, I hate his guts. And man, she did this or whatever. And it could be the person right next to you. It could be the person at work. And, and you go to bed with anger. It says right here, Satan will take that little seed and he will plant it and it will grow into something ugly in your life. He gets, during the nighttime, he does this to your life. He gets a, he gets a handhold on your life. But he doesn't stop there. You see, if you, if you let more nights go by and you don't deal with it and you don't get this out, it festers and he gets a foothold and he starts to scale the spirit of who you are because he wants in. And then if this keeps going, he's going to build up fortresses inside of you that block you from God. He's going to build up fortresses. It, it was just a little handhold and now he's built a tower that opposes Wisdom and people speaking truth in your life about what's really going on, and you just won't hear it from nobody. And you're self-deceived. It's a dangerous thing. And when that happens, your bitterness defiles the people around you. You hurt people. You can't help it. 
It's, it's, it's like the little boy who, who went driving around town with his mommy all day long and they were just hanging out, having a good time. And later on that night, dad gets home and the whole family goes out to eat. And while they were in the car this time, the little boy said, mommy, why do all the idiots start driving when daddy gets behind the wheel? That didn't happen to me, by the way, just not from experience. <laughs> If you find yourself late at night and you're bitter towards anyone and you go to sleep, I mean, there's something you can do about it. You need to hash it out with God until the, that gets uprooted out from you. Because, you know, anger just doesn't come from nowhere. It's caused by something. Angry people go to bed every night without having anyone to talk to and just they get so polluted, you know? And this is one of the most important things I cover in marriage counseling. I mean, I think this is the first scripture I usually show people, whether it's marriage counseling because they've been married for 20 years and they hate each other's guts or whether it's premarital counseling that's a little bit more fun. I always go to this first, always, 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 because it's something Mackenzie and I really try to apply into our life. We believe this spiritual principle. We believe this can really work. And so we, 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 we call it like, don't let the sun go down. And so, you know, there's just times that you do dumb things. And for me, I never do it on purpose. You know, I'm, I'm not a smart man. So I, I, I'll say something or I'll do something in public and she's not gonna say it to me at the time. She's just gonna like bank that away. And I think things are great. And, and then we, we, we brush our teeth and we get ready for bed and, and I'm, I'm ready for that just like pillow talk and catching up and we're about to go to sleep. And, and she'll say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. And you see, I'm like, oh, I'm so tired right now. But you know what? We usually preface it with, hey, you know the whole don't let the sun go down thing? We usually quote the Bible. We put the Bible verse out in front of it because it makes it easier to receive, you know? And so she says it, and we just know we have to deal with it. We don't want the devil in our marriage. We don't want him in our life. And so, okay, we'll turn the light on and... We'll listen to each other. And sometimes I've had to, you know, she, she'll say something and it, it like eats at me a little bit. And it's like, man, I, you offended me in public or I was embarrassed or something. And maybe I should just blow it off, but I'm, 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 sen I'm, I'm sensitive, okay? <laughs> and so it's like, if anyone can hurt me, it's you. So I, I hash it out and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it, baby. It's all good. And you just deal with it for a second. And once you get it up out of the system... God wipes it away and it's all good, right? And those are the nights when, when you, we, you, you go to bed that night. Well, those are the nights when, <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> oh my gosh. Those are, those are the nights when, when you fall asleep, like your toes are touching. Yeah, you know, there's some nights where your backs are just whatever, but you go through something like that, you get it right, I love you. And you single people, you'll see there's nights when like your toe will touch and it's like, oh, we're connected. This is like. Good thing. Yeah. It's, it's good, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Guys, if she stops touching your toe, just there's something wrong, okay? Something wrong because, I mean, with the way a woman's body changes, like over time, she will, she will be all over you. She'll be gone. She'll, you know. <laughs> Use you for warmth and all. Anyways, enough of that. <laughs> and so, hey, if you're the kind of person who runs from any sort of conflict and instead of talking about it, you just let it blow over. If you're the type of person where it's like, I'm not going to say anything. I don't, I don't want it to cause a stir. So you just bury it underneath the rug. That rug is in your heart. And even though you bury it, it's still there. If you're that type of person, you know what? You guys are the ones in most danger of being consumed with bitterness. It's usually the quiet little everyone likes this guy or girl person who festers into being the most bitter person because they don't talk about their junk. And I've seen it in married couples, especially in men and women where they let stuff blow over. They don't talk about it. They don't deal with it. So after 15 years, when it finally comes out, it's super ugly. And if you wait, I mean, that whole, it's like it could have been just a, a little tiny sore that you could get a little bit of pus out. You deal with it and you wipe it away. But if it grows, 
and it all comes out. They end up saying things to each other they can never take back, and it's super hurtful. It's super painful. This is important to address because every single couple who gets divorced first had several, several nights of sitting in their beds, letting this stuff fester up, not dealing with it. Promise you. You get it out quick, let it be a a golden rule for your marriage. We're not going to let the sun go down. I don't care how tired you are. When we wake up this morning, there's not going to be this bitterness growing, lurking down deep inside of you. So if you got stuff that you're bitter about, guys and, and gals, they get bitter at different things. Ladies get bitter at, you know, the laziness. You're not paying attention to me. You don't study me. You don't really know me. Guys are pretty simple. It's usually a lack of intimacy. And bitterness grows. And you got to talk about these things and get it out and serve one another. And, um, you know, it can happen in a range of things, but I think it's crucial to talk about marriage especially. Deal with it. Because if you let it fester after 20 years, it just, it shapes you into something you don't want to become. You become an entirely different person than what you started out as. So, everyone say, don't let the sun go down. Yeah, cool. Well, guys, as, as we close, you know, the, the, the bottom line really it's, it comes down to this. The people who are able to be the most honest with themselves end up being the healthiest people spiritually. Because Jesus said, truth will always set you free. You know, if, if you aren't able to face yourself, it's, it's like being the stubborn person. You know something's wrong, but you'll never go see that doctor. And then when it could have been taken care of quickly, it turns into something maybe life-threatening. And it's easy to be deceived. It's easy to deceive other people. So if you're here today and you got hidden junk, you got hidden sin, um, nobody knows about it, you're hiding it from him or her or them. If, if you even have, you've tried to deceive your heart to think this isn't, this isn't that big of a deal, you're, you're in great danger, okay, of the devil having a major stronghold in your life. Not possessing you, but there would be great oppression in your life. And you don't want that. So... <laughs> You get it out. You be honest with yourself. You get your junk out to God. You find Christians around your life that you can confess things to, especially there can't be anything hidden in your marriage um, because the healthiest marriage are, are things that there's nothing hidden, you know? And I promise you it's, gonna, it's just going to result in this clean, healthy kind of a life. And so however this message applies to you, you know, if you're here today and you are hiding stuff and you, you, you think you're getting away with it because it, you're managing it all, if you haven't got busted, if he or she hasn't caught you yet, if I were you and I read this Bible verse, I would be very scared that I don't belong to God. And that, that would override everything and I would get it out. And I would seek God's correction. God, correct me, chastise me, I need you be in my life. I need you in my life. Don't let me get away with stuff that I shouldn't be. And um, so maybe marriage is maybe you got to talk, talk to your kids, talk to God about who you are and just be truthful about who you really are because you have faults. I have lots of them. Too much time would go by for me to share with you my list. But the important thing is that you know them. It's, it's like this, okay? One last thing. If, if there's two people and they're both dealing in the same sin with equal amounts. Let's say the one person is like, oh, I got this. This isn't that bad. You know, I know it's a little bad, but I can, I can manage this in my life. But the other person is like, oh, I hate this. I, I, I just, I struggle. And I know it's not good, but I'm fighting. And, and every time I do it, I, I ask God for forgiveness. Which life is in a way better spot? It's the person who's being honest with what God says to be honest about truth before God will always bring freedom and health and life to you and to your family. Amen?